If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. John 15 and 18. Well, my civil rights icon would be Rosa Parks. I would ask her, was she afraid of the consequences for um, not giving up her seat to a white person back in that time when there were was violence? Um, I don't know what I would have done in a situation like that, but she opened doors for many of us. Um, now we no longer have to sit on the back of the bus, but we choose to. We don't have to sit on the back of a train or a plane, but we choose to. We don't have to count jelly beans to vote, but we choose not to vote. We take a lot of things for granted. But she reminds me a lot of my mother. Um, my mother, I was told a story by my aunt telling me that my mother had, um, back in the day, it had to have been like 1959, somewhere around there, and she um, she was at a train station. They both were at a train station. And my mother sat down because her feet was hurting. And um, the conductor came by, saw her sitting there, and told her that she had to move because she was sitting in the wrong section for black people. And my mother just looked at him and told the conductor, can't you see, I'm almost nine months pregnant. And I'm not going anywhere. And the conductor just looked at her. My aunt was a little shocked that she said that and just kind of stood there and looked at her. And the conductor looked at her and then he just walked away. So the thing is, is we don't know um, what positions we'll be in, but we thank the Lord that we are to the point now that we can um, enjoy a little bit more in life than what we used to. But my icon is definitely I think when we talk about people during the civil rights era that we would want to meet, I think it's very difficult to say just one person because there were so many people that did just outstanding things during that movement. But there is another person that I remember studying about and reading about during the civil rights era that I don't think gets as much attention um, in our community as he should. And that was Jonathan Daniel. Now you have to remember today, we still see problems with systemic voter suppression. By today's tactics, that suppression is more insidious, but that was not the case in 1965. Black people in the rural South were subjected to intimidation, um, poll tax, literacy tests. Intimidation and just flat out assault when they were trying to register to vote. Dr. King saw that something needed to be done, so Dr. King and members of the Southern Christian leadership decided they were going to converge on Selma to do voter registration. And Dr. King made an impassioned plea to clergy across the nation to come and meet with them in Selma to bring attention to the atrocities that were happening to people in a county in an area where black citizens outnumbered white citizens four to one. And one such person who was a clergy that answered the call from Dr. King was Jonathan Daniel. He was a, a young seminary student from New Hampshire, uh, from the Episcopal Church, actually. And he actually came to Alabama, stayed with a Black family, and worked on the front lines trying to help citizens register so they could exercise their right to vote. After a bloody encounter with law enforcement on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which we now know is has been called Bloody Sunday, many of the activists left the state of Alabama. They saw how dangerous it was. They saw that the police, the citizens were ready to injure, seriously injure, if not kill people over this issue. And all the people that left 
Don and Daniel stayed. Um, and it was during one of the demonstrations in front of one of the stores that had white only signage. Um, the group was arrested. There were about 29 individuals. They took them to jail for picketing. And they actually put all these protesters on a flatbed truck and they said these, these trucks is what they used to haul garbage. That, that's what they did to the protesters. And they take them to this jail so they're stuffed in these little, this little jailhouse and they remain there for six days. And, and it was reported that Jonathan could have actually gotten out, but he stayed. He, he stayed with the other people that were incarcerated because he believed just so strongly that what was happening to them was wrong. So after six days being in jail, they are miraculously released. There had been no bail posted. They just let them all out. And when Jonathan Daniel asked to use the phone, of course, it was denied. So you're in this rural area, you've not been able to use the phone. And so Jonathan Daniel, um, there was a Catholic priest with him by the name of Richard Morris Rowe. And then there were two black young women, Ruby Sales and Joyce Bailey. And they're walking to this store because uh, they're, they're parched, you know, they've been in these horrible, horrible conditions with moldy food. And, hadn't been able to bathe. But they go to the store and Jonathan Daniels asks who sells for a dime so he could get something to drink. And as they're about to enter the store, a man by the name of Tom Coleman meets them right at the door. He's holding a 12 gauge shotgun. He says, you're not gonna be able to come in here. Don't you come in here. And Jonathan Daniels says, are you threatening us? And just as he says that, this Tom Coleman points the gun at Ruby Sales. And Jonathan instinctively pushes her out of the way, onto the ground, as this man shoots. He blows a hole into Jonathan Daniel's chest and kills him instantly. And by this time, I think the two young women and Father Morris were realized they were really in trouble. And so the girls start to run and Father Morris Row turns around to run. And this Tom Coleman shoots again, he shoots him in the back. And you know, he's laying in the street, bleeding. And the other two women, they run to get help, they run to get help. Father Morris Row is laying in the street. He's been critically wounded. And the two young women, they run into town, they try to get help. And in the meanwhile, Tom Coleman, who's still, you know, holding his 12K shotgun, he actually calls the state trooper commander and says, and, they, and this is quoted in the FBI records, I just shot two preachers. You better get down here. And when the coroner came to get the bodies, Jonathan Daniels' dead body is laid on the stretcher and the wounded, injured Father Morris Rose body is laid on top of his on the same stretcher. Well, by the time the, the fellow demonstrators get back to the crime scene, there is no crime scene. Everything's been cleaned. There's no blood. There's nothing. Um, all the physical evidence of the crime have been removed. And the funeral home in Alabama was uh, not cooperating with the family, with Jonathan Daniels' family, to get his body back to New Hampshire. His mother just said, I just want my son's body back. She didn't even know he had been in jail. Um, she just wanted her son's body back. And President Lyndon B. Johnson had to get involved to get Jonathan Daniels' body back to his mother because they, the hatred was so in, and these white clergy coming down, they were considered agitators. So they were being treated just as disrespectfully as they would treat a black citizen. And it was said that President Johnson was beginning to be besieged with having to return dead white civil rights workers back to their families. And so there was this national outcry that people started really paying attention to just how bad things were in the bloody South. Now, when we talk about what happened to the shooter, well, Tom Coleman was indicted for a manslaughter. 
And the attorney general at the time, his name was Richard Flowers, he was outraged. He said, manslaughter, this man should be indicted for murder. He's killed someone in cold blood. Well, Tom Coleman gave another story saying that he was defending the store owner and defending himself. And when the attorney general heard this, he said, it's preposterous. He was so angry. He said, I'm going to try the case myself. So he asked the judge, you know, can we get a delay in the trial? You know, one of my key witnesses is still recuperating from these serious injuries. And the judge denies the request to delay the trial. Now the jury is seated. It's all white jury. It's reported that these are people that Tom Coleman knew. And at one point, the prosecutor became so enraged. He gets into this argument with the judge and the judge takes him off the case, takes him off the case. So in the middle of Tom Coleman's trial, the prosecuting attorneys are now replaced. And after the prosecuting attorney saw this wasn't going well. So we've got to get Morris Rowe to testify. They called him. Now you can imagine the fear he had in being asked to come back into the South, the South where uh, there's the lawless South, the South where he had just been a- attempted murder. There was an attempt on his life and he's being asked to come back. But he agrees to come back to testify. And this self-defense is just kind of playing out. And at one point, the defense brings up two witnesses that say they, they saw it all, it was self-defense, and in fact, that Jonathan Daniel and Father Morris Rowe had weapons. And that's why Tom Coleman shot them. And I guess when they said, well, where did the weapons go? They said, well, these black kids came and, and, and removed the weapons from their, from their bodies. So by the time Father Morris Rowe gets on, you know, to testify, the prosecutor says, can you take off your habit? Because again, he's wearing his, his habit. He's a priest. And they ask him to remove his habit and turn around to the jury. And the jury sees this huge hole in his back. They see this wound. And he said, this man was injured. And the only thing the jury could say to Father Morris Rowe was we heard you kiss one of those black girls in the mouth. And, and in fact, I'm, I'm cleaning it up a little. He said, you, you kissed one of those black little in girls, the N-word girl in the mouth. And of course, Father Morris wrote, so offended and outraged. He said, I've not kissed a woman. I've not kissed any of these women. And the juror looks him in his face and said, that's not what we heard. Not what we heard. So the trial goes on and the jury goes out to deliberate. And the jury deliberates for 63 minutes. And Tom Coleman is acquitted of all charges. And it was noted that when he was exiting the courtroom, he was shaking the hands of the jury. So he was able to get away with whole blood murder. And he was never tried for the deadly assault on Father Morris Rome. Two years after that incident, Tom Coleman was interviewed and they asked him, if you, did you have any remorse? Do you have any remorse about what happened? And he said, no, I'd do it again. And so I guess the question that I have for, for Jonathan Daniel, is that in spite of all that danger, you were going into the bloody South where there had been murders of civil rights workers. When you could have left because of all the danger, why did you stay? And I guess my question to him would be, would you do it again? I was asked to name a civil rights leader I would like to meet or ask questions to. 
And that's just what I've done. I've had the pleasure of sharing with you the person that I would love to ask questions of. I've met the person myself. Person's gone to the next world. And that is A. Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph was a unionist. He was a worker. He was born in 1889. He did many, many things. And he was actually, I call him the founder of the March on Washington. He founded a movement called March on Washington Movement. And what was that? During the 1941, soon after World War I, World War II, he was not very happy with the military's attitude towards African-Americans. African-Americans were not allowed to be integrated into all areas of the armed forces. And he was not happy about that. And he was a porter. He worked many places. He could see the conditions. And he said, the conditions, fair employment, and good conditions are not happening here. So what he did in 1941 is to send to the United States president, who was Franklin Roosevelt at the time, and threatened a march on Washington if there was not a change in the U.S. policy about African-American men in the war being segregated, but yet using being going there to fight and so on. The president listened, and one week before the march was arranged with thousands of people to attend, especially Black people, the president called an executive order, 8802, and said it was illegal to have segregation in the military. His whole attitude was about what are the conditions of African Americans in this United States, work-wise and so on. Fast forward now to the 1963s, to the 60s, at that time, in 1941, Martin Luther King was only about 12 years old. 63, what had happened with A. Philip Randolph and his reputation as a great leader rubbed off on Martin Luther King and his principles of nonviolence that he imported from Gandhi because of the British Empire's relationship with India. Martin Luther King learned and he was influenced by A. Philip Randolph. And when Martin Luther King was invited to go to the March on Washington, A. Philip Randolph was at the helm. He was the chief leader organizer. And he said, you know, we must work together in unity. All the organizations representing different groups must come together and we work together. And they planned it. And that March on Washington was a success that we know it is today. the leaders of that group. A. Philip Randolph, Roy Wilkins of the NAACP, Whitney Young of the National Urban League, 
John Lewis that we know of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Martin Luther King himself, and James Farmer of CORE, and all of these people I got to meet. And why am I so bent on A. Philip Randolph? If we look at all of the advertisements for the March on Washington, it was for freedom, yes. It was for a dream, yes. But it was for jobs too. Jobs now. He was about jobs and employment. And during that time, the NACP asked me, I was a young leader, Martin Luther King, I knew he was my mentor, one of my mentors and my leader. I was one of his aides. They asked me to go to the banks in Ohio, in Columbus, Ohio, and apply for an employment because there were no blacks other than elevators and janitors. I did that in another, for three months from June to August 1961. August 1961, I was chosen and another young lady as the first Blacks to ever work in a bank in Columbus, Ohio, outside of working the elevator or as a janitor. I would love to, to sit down and talk with A. Philip Randolph and ask him about his philosophy, but more than that, who influenced him to be a success, to care about the community, to believe in his own power of doing things, can change things, who influenced him? Who were his motivators? Who were his uplifters? And the other question in leaving, I would like to ask him, what was his advice be today to young people today, growing up to society and to all the organizations? What would you advise today? If I had the opportunity and pleasure to meet with any of the historical civil rights figures, I believe I would choose General Benjamin O. Davis Jr. Uh, General Benjamin O. Davis Jr. was the first black full star, uh, four star general in the United States Air Force. Um, and he was also extremely instrumental in the integration of black people in not only the United States Air Force, but also the military as a whole. He served as a commander for the infamous Tuskegee Airmen, a group of all black uh, pilots who served in World War II and where they showed that black people can not only operate in a professional manner but also be just as successful if not more successful than their white counterparts um so he was very instrumental in the integration of black people in the military as a whole i believe he drafted a, a lot of the documents that allowed black people to serve alongside white people uh in an integrated manner instead of you know having segregated uh units and battalions um so myself being a uh, black man serving in a predominantly white air force and military as a whole, I took a, a great interest in General Benjamin O. Davis Jr. And if I had the opportunity to meet him, I would simply just ask him how he was able to see past and how he had the strength to serve uh, in America and serve a country that didn't love him back and that still treated him as a second class citizen regardless of uh, his accolades, um, his intelligence, regardless of all of the things that he was able to accomplish for the country, um, both domestic and abroad, uh, how he was able to still um, see past that and be able to uh, still want to serve and still have the goal in mind of um, furthering uh, black people and not only the civilian sector but also the um, military sector. Uh, the military is known to be a very um, extreme group. Um, amazing to me that he was able to accomplish so much um, not only for America but you know in this sector of the the military so you know it was just uh, extremely curious how he was able to, to, to look past um, you know all of that, well, all of what was going on um, at that time, and still serve the country uh, while still serving Black people at the same time. Cat Talks wants to thank advertiser YesAmadiva.com. Their mission is to uplift, empower, and celebrate women of faith. 
In addition to their Sassy Bling custom tees, they have books, stationery, accessories, and more. You can follow Yes I'm a Diva .com on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Tabernacle Talks gives honor to God as we recently were a bronze winner in the inaugural Anthem Awards for 2022 for our just blockbuster piece, An Examination of the Dream. This piece has not only won a Best Christian Documentary, um, but it has now won a bronze award for the Anthem Awards, and we are so grateful. The producers of Tabernacle Talks, Curtis Welch and I, Dr. Michelle Pierce Mobley, were notified that Tabernacle Talks received a gold Telly Award for our piece, The Examination of the Dream. The Examination of the Dream aired in January in recognition of the MLK holiday. For those unfamiliar with the Telly Award, this award is the equivalent of the Oscar for movies. This award goes to organizations, marketing, and PR firms for commercial work across all screens, there are various categories to submit completed projects. There are animation categories, social justice categories, and nonprofit categories, to name a few. There were approximately 15,000 entries from the United States and five continents, and only about 7% of those entries received an award from honorable mention to gold. We entered the social impact category for the King piece and we're speechless when we found out that we'd won a gold statue, which is the highest award possible. Our work is now alongside Disney, Pixar, Viacom, CBS Interactive, and the Smithsonian Institute, African American Museum of History. We give all honor to God for this highest honor of our work and wanna thank the Tabernacle Baptist Church for the use of your facilities in creating this work that is now being broadcast across the globe and to our peers in the creative community.